Okay, let's get started then. Um, okay, so hello, I'm Derek, uh, and today uh, we're going to be going over uh, Nextflow. So it's going to be two sections. We're going to be doing an AM session and a PM session. Um, so this is the AM session. Um, Okay, so before we begin, I wanted to acknowledge that the land on which we gather today uh, is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, and I hope that uh, together um, we can, uh, through our learning and our uh, sharing, uh, we can find truth and reconciliation. Um, so copper information. So uh, everything that you're gonna see today is under the CCBYSA 4.0 um, Creative Commons license. Uh, so this means you are free to share this material with other people. Um, you're free to adapt it, um, to take the slides and to change them for your own purposes. Um, the only thing is that you need to provide attribution um, to the people who made them. Um, and if you do modify them, uh, to also apply the same license to that material. Um, okay, so today it's going to be a kind of truly is a hitchhiker's guide to Nextflow. So the goals aren't really for you to be proficient uh, in writing Nextflow uh, by the afternoon. I think that's a uh, tall task. Um, but I really hope that by the end of the morning session, at least, uh, you'll feel very comfortable uh, standing up a an established Nextflow pipeline for whatever your own personal purposes are. Um, and then if you sit through the afternoon session, I hope that you'll have a solid foundation uh, for uh, reading Nextflow, um, but also with a little bit more uh, learning and reading, uh, writing uh, a little bit of Nextflow yourself. Um, okay, so really briefly about me. Uh, so I'm currently a master's uh, student um, in the Department of Bioinformatics at UBC. Um, I worked at the Genome Sciences Center as a computational biologist for two years. Um, and then before that, I also went to UBC for my undergrad. Um, that was a Bachelor of Science in Biotech and a minor in Computer Science. Um, so I guess like many young adults who grew up in Vancouver, uh, I like to do all the Vancouver things. Uh, I like to go backpacking, I like to go hiking. Um, I like bouldering and sport climbing outdoors. Uh, I played a lot of badminton in the past. I still play it now, mostly recreationally. Um, and then with COVID, I kind of picked up board games and uh, online chess. So that's where all my time's been. Um, okay, so a really high level overview of what we're going to be going over uh, this morning. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce Nextflow to everybody, uh, why you should use it, what Nextflow is, um, where it's applicable. Um, and then we're gonna go into something called NF Core. So I'm not gonna spoil that, but it's an excellent resource. And I think it's gonna be the main takeaway for the morning. Um, then we're going to go into configuring a workflow, um, how you can set it up to not just run locally, but to run on the uh, UBC cluster, uh, Sockeye. Um, and then we're going to try to run our own Nextflow uh, workflow uh, set up uh, with a specific workflow in NF4. Um, so this is the code share link. Um, so if you click it, it'll take you to... Maybe I can do this. Uh, it'll take you to a place where everyone can uh, write code. Um, so we're going to use this just for questions. So if you could, you know, if you have any questions and you wanted to post them publicly, this is kind of the better place to do it than in uh, Zoom chat because that will disappear. Um, but here we can kind of reply in place and then people can look through them uh, in case they have the same questions. Um, our in-person TAs are Dr. Philip Richmond. Um, and online TAs are uh, Selene and Oriel. Um, so everyone here is very qualified, very smart. Um, so they, we have uh, great support uh, for both sessions today. Um, my slides are not happy. Sorry. Oh, great. Oh, excellent. All right. Back. All right. Okay. So first, what is Nextflow? Um, so I'm going to answer it very directly at first, and I think this will raise more questions than it answers uh, for some of you. So the Nextflow language is, uh, it's a programming language that lets you easily write a scalable, reproducible, scientific workflow. Um, so 
next, the next flow language is easy to prototype. Um, it's easy to write a pipeline, uh, really, that's in a language of your preference um, that you're comfortable with, whether that's R or Python um, or anything else. Um, it supports containers natively. Um, so this means you can get version tooling, you can access um, kind of environments that are kind of pre set up. So you don't have to worry about uh, conflicts and things like that and dependencies. Um, and importantly, it can be run locally or on a high performance cluster. So you don't need a ton of configuration. You don't have to write a lot of like uh, PBS Pro header code or anything. Um, it's easy to get set up uh, on a variety of execution types. Um, so that's a lot of jargon if you don't know uh, a lot about uh, workflows. Um, so I wanted to, at a very high level, talk about why you even need to write a workflow. Um, so obviously, sequencing experiments are becoming more and more popular. I'm sure all of you um, in your own labs, uh, if you're not working on sequencing data yourself, I'm sure you know somebody in your lab who is definitely working on sequencing experiments. Um, and they're very useful for answering a very large variety of scientific questions. Uh, however, uh, processing and analyzing the data can be quite daunting. Uh, there's new tools coming out every day um, with uh, varying levels of support and documentation. Um, especially in academia. Uh, and of course, just learning to write code can be uh, very scary. Um, and especially in science, uh, documentation and reproducibility is key. So just like in the wet lab, where you keep a lab journal and you write everything down, um, dry, lab, dry lab work should also be traceable and understandable by others. Uh, so obviously you would ideally be like taking notes or like logging your work in some kind of um, ticketing system or something like that. Um, but with a workflow, uh, I don't want to say that it's self-documenting because you should still be documenting it. But a workflow, writing a workflow that specifies exactly how you did something, um, it's kind of a two-in-one solution where you explicitly say what you want to do, and then the code that you wrote will actually uh, do it for you. Um, so everything is nicely documented and everything uh, can be nicely versioned depending on how you implement it. Um, so I wanted to touch on the FAIR principles as well. So FAIR principles uh, were something that was established uh, a few years ago, I think, um, but it really lays a foundation for how data specifically uh, should be shared and published. Um, so the idea is that you want things to be as reproducible and traceable and trackable as possible, um, again, especially in science. Um, so as you know, any workflows you write create data and ingest data, uh, workflows should also adhere to the FAIR principles. Um, so FAIR is an acronym. It stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and workflows uh, help you easily cover two of the four bases, really. Um, so you can read these for yourself. Um, but really, uh, if you write a workflow, um, your workflow is likely to be interoperable. So it means that your workflow will work with a variety of data because it's designed to be flexible. Um, and it's going to be reusable if you document it well and you design it well. Um, other people will be able to use your workflow to create more data that is um, itself fair. So that's why you want to use a workflow. So uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of other workflow languages. Um, so popular ones in uh, science and bioinformatics are uh, Snakemake and uh, CWL. Um, so Nextflow is a popular option among those three, but any specific reasons to pick one over the other, um, it's more of a kind of personal preference, but also if you're looking for very specific features, you'd want to make sure that the language you're picking has it. Um, I guess one of the main things that uh, help people select one language over another um, is comfort with the like underlying language that the workflow language was written in. So if you're very comfortable with Python already, uh, Snakemake will probably be easy for you to learn and work with. Um, I know CWL is kind of in, used more in industry and it's kind of an industry standard and it's very powerful, um, but I haven't written any CWL myself. Um, but there is a very specific reason that uh, we're gonna be doing and teaching Nextflow today. Um, and one of them is that it's easy to uh, prototype. It's easy to troubleshoot because of the way that it executes um, from the bottom up. Um, so if you run into any issues, you can go right in and look at what's wrong and run the command yourself to see what's going on. Um, it rarely works with computing clusters. Um, 
and it can really be used to execute existing code in a language of your preference. So if you already have some kind of processing script in like R, you can use uh, Nextflow to run that script on your data. Um, so really it's kind of uh, the glue that holds your uh, processing workflow together. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, um, why would we use Nextflow if Nextflow just calls another language or another script? It uh, seems like just more overhead. Um, so I guess the main thing with workflows is when you have many different tools um, that are, if you have outputs from one tool that's going to be sent as input to another tool, um, if it's just one or two links in the chain, it can be pretty easy to handle. But if you have a workflow with like 10 tools or 15 tools, and let's say you wanna run one of those tools in like three different parameters, three different ways to like compare something, um, it's gonna get pretty hairy pretty quickly. So that's one of the reasons that you might want to use a workflow language. Um, so it's kind of more of an advantage that it can use other languages because if you already know R or you already know Python, um, you might already have the bioinformatics skills to manipulate your data or you're familiar with those tools and those languages, then you can still use that and then just use Nextflow to organize everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so kind of alluding to the next section here. Um, the main reason that I wanted to show Nextflow today um, is that there's actually an excellent bioinformatics oriented Nextflow development community. Um, and that's going to be the focus uh, of what we're gonna talk about next. Um, before we get there, um, I did want to get into installing Nextflow really quickly. So uh, if you go to that link there, um, the installation for Nextflow is really uh, dead simple. Um, you just download their executable um, and then it's very small. You make it executable and then uh, it will download all its dependencies and things in the background um, and it'll cache them. Um, but we've already done that on Sockeye for your convenience. So if you run this line, um, you should be able to export uh, this path into your uh, binary path. And if you run Nextflow version, uh, you should get some output. works great okay all right so then we're going to get into uh nf core so what is nf core so nf core is a community driven uh development it's a collection of nextflow pipelines um, that are community developed, community maintained. Um, they're published um, in Nature Biotech in this uh, correspondence article in 2020, um, but it's continuously being developed. There are tons of workflows inside um, and it's great for really any kind of bioinformatics uh, processing or analysis that you could dream of. Um, and this really is the reason to use Nextflow right now, I think. Um, so, and of course, kind of core concepts are that the pipelines are created collaboratively. They go through a peer review process through code review, um, and they implement the current best practices. So if there's any kind of review article that comes out comparing tools, um, they will try their best to get the best tools there or to have options for uh, any tools that are kind of tied for um, popularity. Um, so their main goal is to provide a high quality bioinformatics pipeline uh, that can be used across all institutions. Um, so all of their docu or all of their workflows are very well documented. They're very uh, user friendly, and this really lowers the barrier of analysis for non-informatics individuals. And this is really going to be the goal of the talk this morning. So I'm going to walk us through setting up a NF Core workflow, um, 
And the goal is that you'll gain some familiarity and for whatever applications you would like in the future, uh, this could be a very viable option for you. Um, so if you go to this link here, um, you can scroll through all the current pipelines that are available in NF Core, and you'll see that the list really is uh, quite extensive. Um, you can also see the last time that they were versioned. Um, and if you go to the very bottom, I think you can see workflows that are in development. So if you're really savvy with Nextflow, uh, you could help develop some of these if they're relevant to your research. Um, but for today, we're going to dive into, if I can find it, this workflow right here. So we're going to dive into RNA-seq. Um, so if you haven't worked with RNA-seq data yet, um, you definitely will uh, in your in your career. Um, but RNA-seq is, oh, before we get into that, yeah. So the NF Core RNA-seq pipeline. So this pipeline uh, is intended to perform the QC and analysis or pre-processing of uh, RNA-seq data. Um, so this doesn't include any differential expression analysis, doesn't include any kind of like functional analysis. This really is to turn your reads into uh, quantification, so any gene counts. Um, so this is one of the oldest and most contributed to pipelines within NF Core. So it's on version 3.8.2 actually. Um, and I think version one released in August, 2018. Um, and since that time, there's been 460 forks, 488 stars, and 3,700 commits. Um, and I believe uh, version two was a huge rewrite that coincided with a big um, syntax update uh, with Nextflow. Um, so this really is a, it's one of the original uh, pipelines in NF4. Okay, so uh, what is RNA seq? So I think I'm going to guess most people in this uh, who are at this at this talk uh, are familiar with RNA seq. But just so I can be sure we're all on the same page, I'm just going to talk really briefly about what RNA seq is. Um, so I saw this comic and I thought it was uh, pretty funny. It was actually published. It was or yeah, it was published in 2013. Um, but it was an interesting take on what the kind of RNA seq problem space is. Um, so if you imagine this uh, kind of uh, magazine kiosk, um, and they have all kinds of different magazines. Um, so some of them are going to be more stocked. They have more copies of them because they're more popular. Um, but they're also going to have more like niche magazines um, for people who are into like niche hobbies, and they're not going to carry a lot of them because they're not going to sell a lot. So the kind of challenge here is if you bought out the entire magazine kiosk, and then you put all their magazines through a shredder and then you tried, and so you scrambled all of them and then you tried to recreate all of the magazines that were originally in the kiosk, um, you kind of have the RNA-seq problem. Um, so the idea is if this kiosk was a sample um, and all of these magazines um, were pieces of RNA, um, after they go through the shredder, which is essentially a sequencer, we're gonna have all these little pieces of the original RNA um, that you're trying to reassemble um, and you're going to try to put them back together to figure out what the original magazine or transcript uh, was in this case. Um, so formally, uh, RNA-seq is an assay that's used to study the transcriptome and this is done by quantifying the RNA molecules in a sample. Um, so the most common use case for this is to estimate gene expression, um, but there's many other uh, ways that RNA-seq data can be analyzed. And this includes looking for uh, alternative splicing, aberrant splicing. Um, it can also be used to look for variants um, within coding regions. Um, but at a very high level, you're taking all these reads, you're getting an alignment. And then from that alignment, you're basically counting the gene expression. And from that, you want to get out a matrix um, that will give you the basically an estimate of how much each gene is expressed within each of your samples. I mean, as you can see, uh, RNA-seq is becoming increasingly popular uh, since 2008, um, and it's probably not going to go away anytime soon. Um, so everyone's seen this is like the central dogma. So for a piece of DNA, you have some gene, and that gene has exons, and those exons are gapped by introns. And after they're transcribed into a piece of pre-mRNA, pre they'll be spliced. 
and you'll kind of get all these different um, isoforms and they eventually become different proteins. Um, so the challenge here, and if you're looking at this single gene, um, is to grab these mRNA molecules in the middle here and quantify them. Uh, so the way you do that is with sequencing. Oh, these slides are out of order. So the idea here is once you have a piece of mRNA, it'll be broken up into little pieces and these reads are going to be sequenced by a machine and the sequence will be acquired. And those reads will actually have a uh, very interesting problem um, for those who are keenly paying attention. Uh, if the sequence is gapped, uh, when you look at the reads that are derived from pieces of mRNA, um, you'll actually have pieces that are separated on a reference genome um, by the intron. Um, so this is something that needs to be solved uh, when you're looking at RNA-seq data. So the idea here is you're going to take these reads, you're going to figure out how they're gapped, which will take you back to the gene, and that'll let you place each piece of mRNA um, on the reference. And once you have all these reads lined up, you'll be able to figure out how much of this gene was quantified or how much of this gene was expressed, and that lets you quantify it. And then you just do this um, like 20,000 times. Uh, so all the steps that I just described are essentially somewhere inside this NF-core RNA-seq schematic. Um, so I thought this diagram was really great for just getting a really high level overview of what's possible um, inside this RNA-seq pipeline. Um, so you can see in terms of the steps, if you look at each of these little nodes on this transit map style schematic, um, these are all steps or tools that are being executed on the data. And you can see how the data kind of flows um, from stage one here all the way into uh, stage five with all the various outputs. And you can see that it forks in some places where um, different tools are preferred um, by different groups and they want to keep the workflow as flexible as possible. Um, so these are all options that can be configured uh, when you run a workflow like this. Um, so we're gonna get into each step uh, kind of really briefly just so that I can connect what I just said conceptually about how the RNA-seq um, analysis should occur to the various pieces um, of this NF-core RNA-seq workflow. Um, okay, so the first, the first piece. So the first piece is really preparing your reads for alignment. So you're gonna do a little bit of uh, quality assessment. So, you, so even before you align your reads, you can look at the reads you have and say if there's any kind of uh, bias in them um, if you can see if there's a, any oddities in the read length distribution, anything like that. Um, and also uh, you're gonna do some trimming here. So depending on what kind of sequencing uh, you've done, uh, there can be adapters, there could be UMIs, um, there can be just basically sequence in your reads that are not kind of biological data and were used to assist in the protocol or to assist in the analysis. So those need to be taken out because those sequences don't exist in the reference. Um, and uh, you just need to separate them so that you can align them. Um, so at the end of this step, you're basically going to come out with these cleaned up fast cues. And these are basically uh, the read sequences without uh, any adapters, all trimmed, um, all QC'd um, that you will use for alignment in step two. Okay, so alignment and quantification. So all these cleaned up short reads will then be placed within the reference um, using some kind of alignment algorithm. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, because of this kind of interesting problem uh, where uh, you have splicing and then the reads that are generated from mRNA are actually, um, they're gonna be gapped or they're gonna be jumping this uh, kind of exon junction. Um, you need an aligner that is capable of looking for these splice junctions. Um, so you, in RNA-seq, you're gonna use a splice-aware aligner. Um, so some of the more popular ones are STAR and HiSat2. Um, and those are two of the options that are here uh, in the NF-core RNA-seq pipeline. Um, and once these reads are aligned, you're going to use them to kind of estimate the abundance of RNA that was transcribed. And that's what salmon or rsem is going to do. And that's going to output a text file, essentially, that tells you how many reads relatively um, each gene had uh, compared to the other genes. And that gives you kind of an understanding of 
what the uh, transcriptomic profile of your sample is. Um, okay, so from there, um, you're going to have alignments. So the alignments are going to be compressed and indexed. So these files can be quite large. Um, so there is a, uh, a different format that they're changed into called uh, BAMs. And these BAMs are much smaller, and they can be indexed and sorted um, so that they're able to be used for a variety of downstream tools. So depending on what kind of analyses you want to go forward with, uh, you'll need these BAMs. So these are outputted by the workflow. Um, here we can also mark duplicate reads. Um, so you can either just kind of like soft flag them or you can filter them out of your reads. Um, and then you're also going to be able to estimate coverage at this point. So here uh, you can use, uh, so here they use, yeah, genome code, um, but you can, uh, you'll get basically a big wig or wiggle track. Um, and this is something that can be visualized in a genome browser and that'll tell you um, what kind of coverage you've got uh, based uh, from your uh, RNA-seq experiment. Okay, so in the last step, uh, it's all quality control. So you're going to be getting a really nice HTML report at the end that tells you uh, all of the QC metrics that you could possibly want um, on your data. So it'll tell you about duplicates. It'll tell you about if you have any um, oddities in your read length distribution, um, if you have any biases in nucleotide distribution at any specific positions, if you have any GC bias, things like that. Um, so it does say DC two here. So those of you who are paying attention will know that I said earlier that uh, there's no differential expression analysis, but DEC2 is a differential expression uh, library. Um, so DEC2 here is run, but only for uh, a PCA analysis. So this is a really high level um, kind of correlation between your samples that were run just to see uh, to give you a really general idea of if any of your samples are more similar to each other um, than they are to others. I mean, that can give you a really high level understanding of whether or not you have any differential expression at all. Um, so the designers of this workflow decided not to include differential expression um, because of kind of like just the number of variables that are involved. So uh, differential expression is a very, uh, can be a very complicated, um, procedure, and you want to make sure that you're kind of controlling for as many variables as possible so that your uh, any kind of difference in expression that you observe uh, is as real as possible. Um, so I'm not going to be covering differential expression today, but if you're signed up for the workshop on Tuesday, um, we have a session where we're going to go deep into uh, RNA-seq analysis. Okay, so what kind of outputs are you gonna end up with? So the kind of key outputs you're looking for from kind of any RNA-seq uh, processing pipeline um, are going to be uh, first these two files here, uh, the BAM and the BAM index. So your BAM are gonna be the aligned reads uh, compressed. Um, and then the BAM index is gonna be a way for various tools to kind of get into the BAM efficiently. Um, so these two files together uh, may be inputs to some tools that uh, you want to use downstream, depending on what kind of analysis you're doing. Um, and then the big one for most people is going to be this gene expression matrix. So you're going to get a gene expression quantification as this um, tab separated file. Um, and it's just a summary of your read abundance. Um, and then finally, you're going to get uh, coverage um, as this uh, bigwig file. So it's just a track style summary of read coverage. So these are the four files that we're going to be looking for uh, when we run the workflow. Okay, um, so at the halfway point, uh, does anyone have any questions uh, before I jump on ahead? Okay. Okay. So next flow configuration. So what is next flow configuration? So one of the main strengths of next flow is that it separates uh, your pipeline logic from the parameters that you are feeding it. Um, so this means that all of the kind of the code that's telling the tools uh, how to run, um, where to look for files, where to write files, those are all separated. 
or they can be separated um, from the parameters that you want to specify. So in the case of RNA-seq, you may want to specify, oh, I want to align to a specific version of the human genome, or um, I want to skip you know, specific steps of the pipeline. So these are all uh, things that you can do with NextFlow. Um, so parameters come in two flavors. So when you think of them as kind of general NextFlow parameters, and then kind of workflow specific parameters. So general NextFlow parameters are available to all NextFlow workflows. So these are things that were implemented uh, fundamentally inside the NextFlow language. And this will let you do um, all kinds of things with specifying uh, how a workflow should be executed, um, specifying how many resources should be used uh, per process, um, things like that. So those are kind of very low level um, parameters. Then there are going to be workflow specific parameters. So these are parameters that are exposed to the user by the person who wrote the workflow. Um, so these will all vary depending on what workflow you are using. Uh, so in the case of RNA-seq, these would be things like which uh, genome version uh, you want to use, uh, where your uh, alignment uh, indices files are. Um, so obviously those are workflow specific because if you're not doing an RNA-seq workflow, um, you don't need things like uh, the index files. Um, okay, so to compare them kind of side by side, uh, the general NextFlow parameters are parameters that can be set in any NextFlow workflow. They're going to be documented in nextflow.io. So these are things that are, again, fundamental to the language. And they allow you to control things like job scheduling um, and how to report performance and export those types of things. Uh, workflow specific parameters are parameters that the workflow writer exposed to the user. These are going to be documented in whatever documentation that workflow has. Um, and they're typically used to supply things like sample files, metadata, paths to references, uh, things along those lines. Okay, so writing the NextFlow configuration file. So NextFlow is a very flexible tool. So configuration or these parameters can actually be fed to NextFlow at runtime in the command line. So like any other uh, tool that you would use at the command line, you can use uh, dash dash flags to feed it um, all kinds of things. Uh, however, uh, because we are trying to be reproducible and to kind of specify options explicitly, because if you kind of specify things at runtime, um, those commands will be lost once your command line history is gone. Um, but if you write a configuration file, um, you'll be able to look at that and reference that. And long after you have forgotten what you've done, uh, you can go back and take a look inside the configuration file to see uh, what happened and how something was executed. Um, so today we're gonna to be writing a configuration file for running NFCore RNA-seq on the Sockeye job scheduler. So that is a Nextflow specific configuration on um, these uh, downsampled uh, kind of toy data test samples that I have. And those are going to be workflow specific uh, parameters. Okay, so before we get into that, um, for those of you who haven't been to any of the previous workshops yet, you're going to have to create a student space. So I think um, when I was testing this yesterday, we had some issues with space, and I believe that's been resolved now. Um, so all of these should work, but if you run into anything weird, it could be related to that. Um, so what you want to do is go into the Scratch space um, inside workshops, student spaces. You're going to want to make your own working directory, and then you're going to want to copy out the template files. So for the morning session, it's going to be the files at this path. So you just do a cp-a, you'll get those files um, into your student space. Yeah, and I encourage you to, if you don't have the slides open already, to open those and download them or get them in a way where you can copy and paste out of them um, so you're not uh, desperately trying to transcribe off the slide. archive copy so it's like it retains all the like permissions and stuff yeah yeah you don't have to do anything yeah
Okay. Just give it another minute. Okay, so um, here at UBC, uh, we have a high performance computing cluster uh, called Sockeye. Um, so this was kind of went into depth um, a few days ago by Phil. Um, so if you've missed that, uh, I would recommend going to look at the recording of that session, because uh, I'm not gonna go into that much depth here, but I'm just gonna kind of go over it really briefly so that we're all on the same page with what's happening and why we're you know going through the trouble of scheduling jobs and things like that. Um, so Nextflow innately is capable of running workflows locally on your computer. Um, so if you don't kind of specify anything about execution, it will just run on the CPUs inside your laptop or your desktop or whichever. Um, but it's also capable of, um, scheduling jobs to all kinds of job schedulers. There are many, many schedulers out there and Nextflow is configured for, uh, a lot of them. And you can see all of those, if you have some specific cluster that you work on, that is a different type of job scheduler. Um, you can look at the documentation for that inside nextflow.io. Um, but the way to configure that at a very high level is we're gonna use executor parameters, um, which specify the type of job schedule that you have, and that'll tell Nextflow what kind of commands it needs to run in order to dispatch the jobs. Um, and then uh, you need to specify the queue, um, which just tells you kind of what priority you have access to or what priority you want to submit the jobs at. Um, and then any additional submission related parameters. Um, so at UBC, there's uh, various quotas for different groups. So this is one of those submission related parameters that we'll need to specify um, to say under which quota we are going to be submitting our jobs. Okay, so really briefly, uh, uh, Sockeye is a high performance computing cluster. So that means that there are a lot of compute nodes, um, which are in green here, that are basically uh, really powerful computers. Um, and these are all the little computers that are going to be doing all the analysis, doing all the heavy lifting. Um, but in order to kind of um, use them as efficiently as possible, um, a job scheduler is put in place um, so that you can't directly interact with the compute nodes, but so that there's kind of like um, fair usage and everyone's jobs will eventually be run and no one is kind of hogging all the resources, um, you'll have to interact with it through a job scheduler. And you can interact with the job scheduler from a login node. So this is what happens, or this is where you land uh, when you connect to UBC's Sockeye system. You'll be at some, uh, one of the three login nodes. And from here, you're able to submit requests to the compute node um, through a scheduler. And this tells uh, the cluster just how many nodes you want, how many CPUs you want, how many GPUs you want, and then how much memory you need. Um, so that's how you're kind of uh, separated from the compute nodes and how the data is kind of shared. Okay, so in order to like uh, submit a job to PBS Pro, which is the job schedule that we have at Sockeye, um, you need to write a PBS Pro header. Um, so typically, uh, it'll look something like this. So you'll have all these uh, what look like comments, but are not comments because they're special and they have the um, letters PBS after them. Um, you're going to use this to specify um, all those things that I just mentioned. So how many CPUs you want, how much memory you want, um, what queue you're going to be submitting to, and then what kind of quota you're going to be submitting on. So Inside that directory that we just opened, you'll see something called nf-core-rnaseq.config. Um, and inside there, uh, you'll want to look at the config and see uh, how that compares to this. So let me see if I can open. So this would be the file that you would see. And this is kind of the config. So if you look down through it, um, you'll see the executor parameters um, that are inside here. So right there. So if we compare these kind of side by side with 
a equivalent header, um, you'll see that many of the arguments kind of translate one to one. So here you can see that the executor uh, has been specified to be PBS Pro. Um, and this is because PBS Pro is being run on Sockeye. Um, so if there was a different scheduler like Slurm, then this would say Slurm, and this would just tell NextFlow um, how to dispatch jobs. Um, so the queue that's specified here, so uh, inside this PBS header, we see Sockeye. So here um, inside NextFlow, you just specify Q equals Sockeye, um, and that'll tell, you, tell it uh, which queue to submit jobs to. And then finally, um, in terms of cluster options, um, you wanted to specify what uh, quota you're going to be submitting under. Um, so this is something that will be uh, a common error if you uh, don't specify this. Um, your jobs will look like they submitted, but they won't submit because PBS Pro won't accept them. But NextFlow will be waiting for a job to complete um, that doesn't actually exist. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the question was, can you add any other options that we've seen in the past, like um, emailing to let you know when a job is completed or it's errored out? Yeah. So all of those can be added under cluster options. So if you go to the NextFlow documentation, actually, maybe we can do that together. Um, Yeah, I can't get out of the slides. Okay, let's just do this. So here you can see kind of all of the um, various uh, job schedulers that are implemented. So we go down to PBS Pro. Um, you'll see the kind of various cluster options that are available. So I think if you go to here, I guess I just want to go. Yeah, it'll, it'll tell you kind of which arguments or parameters are kind of built in. Um, but everything else that doesn't fall under any of these categories. So it looks like the email is not in here. Um, you'll have to specify through uh, cluster options, um, which you just saw there. And that is also how I submitted um, the quota. So you could do the same thing, just add more to this and you'll be able to get an email, for example, uh, when your job completes. So the question is about finding CPU Uh, yes, yeah, so the question was whether we can combine queues like CPU and GPU queues. Um, I don't actually know. I think if I remember, I, I remember reading something in the Sockeye documentation. There's like specific queue names that let you submit a hybrid job, um, but I'm not, I, I don't know off the top of my head. So it could be possible that the queue Yeah, yeah. So there, I know there's a few queues, and if you have access to them, they have like different allocations that, and I believe some of them are hybrid queues. Um, so that would be where you'd want to look, I think. Yeah. But yeah, so that would that'd be something that'd be, that's configured on like the Sockeye side on systems. Um, I don't know if it's possible to do that here. Okay. All right, so that was our configuration for uh, getting um, a job scheduler uh, figured out. Um, so the next configuration that we want to change is to kind of specify where our samples are and uh, how the uh, workflow should execute. Um, and these are things that are gonna be specific to that rna -seq pipeline from NF Core. Um, so even if you use a different rna -seq pipeline, uh, which we'll be doing in the afternoon, um, these configurations uh, do not translate. So these are completely specific to the like the workflow that you're using um, because they are 
exposed to you by the person who wrote it. Um, so these are all found in the online documentation. Um, so for RNA-seq, these are the things that we absolutely need. So we need a, a sample sheet um, with paths and metadata for a fast queues. So this is very common um, within NF Core, um, this kind of template. Um, and it, so it expects these in a very specific format. And I believe um, we can see that here. So this is an example sample sheet for what we're going to be running today. So it's, you can see it's four samples. Um, and these are from the GeoVetus uh, RNA-seq data. Um, so this is publicly available and it's paired with the Thousand Genomes Project. So these are just four of those, uh, four of those libraries um, paired end. Um, so it's your R1 and there's your R2. And these are just kind of the minimal configuration that you need. Um, so these are four paired end libraries. Okay. Um, yeah, so you need a sample sheet. Um, you're also going to need a reference genome ID. So um, the NF Core pipelines are all written to be very, very user friendly. Um, but the thing is, if you specify this genome ID alone, um, it'll actually download it at runtime. So it makes like the execution of the pipeline very convenient. Um, but it means that execution could be like actual execution could be slower because it's actually downloading uh, the references from the internet um, at runtime. Um, so this is something that we're going to try to get around in our config, um, but it's a little bit complicated. Uh, and then uh, you need to specify the output directory uh, for your alignments, for your reports, um, all the outputs from this workflow. Um, okay, so this is an example of a uh, command to execute Nextflow on uh, NF Core uh, RNA seq. Um, so here is the input. So this is that sample sheet that you're uh, that we just looked at. Um, this output directory is just the name of a directory where um, the the BAMs and the Wiggle file will be written to. This is where I specify the version of the genome that I want to align to. Um, and then this is an additional parameter um, that makes it so that the toy data doesn't uh, QC fail. But this is something that we needed to include. So if you click on this link, um, it'll actually take you Oh, did I copy this link here? I may have copied the link here. You want to go to the NF Core website and you're just looking for that big green button at the top. Yeah, so you're looking for this. So you just want to click uh, launch version on the landing page for the RNA-seq uh, pipeline. And if you scroll down, you'll see a configuration wizard, basically. And this is kind of a 20,000 foot overview of everything that's possible in this workflow. You can see it takes a ton of parameters that do all kinds of things um, from skipping various QC steps um, to specifying which aligners you wanna use, um to you know if you are very specific about how your reads need to be trimmed um because of your chemistry uh all of that can be configured in here and if you configure it um it will give you a very large uh copy and pasteable um execution uh line that you can just copy and paste into a terminal and it will run um but because we're trying to be uh, trying to document everything. Okay. Just trying to document everything. Um, we're going to be writing uh, the configurations that we care about to a config file. Okay. So if you look inside the configuration file, you go down. Yeah, so right here where I've said NF Core RNA-seq parameters, um, you can see uh, all of those are translated 
um, to be equivalent. So you've got the input that points you to the path of the file. So all these are relative to the execution directory. So this is all assuming that you're running this inside your um, that student space directory that you just copied out. Um, and the output directory will be relative, the genome. So this is all pretty much a one-to-one -one translation. Okay, so just as a user exercise, if you want to be challenged, um, what could we include if we wanted to skip the dupe radar QC tool execution? So that can be something that we'll be able to find inside uh, the kind of config wizard. Found it. So what's the there's both a param dot yml and a Yeah. So I was hoping nobody would ask. <laughs> because that is kind of one of those hairy things that I had to do. So uh we can get into it. Um so the only thing inside this NF core RNA seq params. Um, is a path to the reference unit. So I alluded to this earlier, where I said that the um, if you just specify the genome version, um, the pipeline will very conveniently download all the references from iGenomes. Um, so this includes your star indexes, your high sat two indexes, um, all your like um, your gene annotation files, all of those things. So they're all versioned exactly the way that you want, um, but it takes a lot of time to download depending on the speed of your internet connection, or in this case, the speed of your internet connection um, from iGenomes to uh, Sockeye, which actually is really good, but we just don't wanna be wasting that kind of space in everybody's home directories. So uh, here, there's a way to specify uh, a reference copy of the iGenomes path. Um, however, and this is why you need to read the documentation, um, you cannot specify this inside the configuration file. And this is because of the way that NF core RNA seq uh, parses your config. So what happens is it's going to have already parsed your config. It, it'll have already parsed your parameters regarding which genome version you want. Um, and it'll start downloading before it even knows whether or not you have this iGenomes base kind of cached somewhere. So you have to put it in this very specific YAML file that you uh, feed it separately. Um, and this file is parsed before any other file. And that's why this is this specific line has to be here, because then it will know not to try and download all the references on every execution. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, so uh, this one is still a uh, NF core. Okay, sorry. So the question was oh, uh, whether or not, because we have two files, if one of them is uh, the like, yeah, per se, the general parameters and the other one is like the workflow parameters. So no, that's not the case here. So this is actually a really devious case of a workflow specific parameter. So if you feed iGenomes base, like the specific line to some other uh, workflow, it won't interpret it. Um, this is something that's very specific to um, NF core, but I believe the iGenomes base in like many of the NF core workflows um, can be used. So you can, you know, if you have one, you know, uh, genome build 38 reference, it can be used for multiple NF4 workflows. But like, for example, if I wrote an uh, RNA-seq workflow, I wouldn't use this or I may not use this, right? So it's not uh, it's not general. The only general parameters are the ones that you find in the Nextflow IO documentation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. 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 Someone was asking like, um, so these models read before the pump, right? Yeah. Um, can we 
can do to the, to the other family in the in the model, or that would be the purpose of having this violation. Yes. So you can also. So that's a great question. So all the things that are in here. So all the workflow specific parameters, so things like the input and the output directory, all of these things, they can be put in that YML file. But again, this is a very, this is a very like NF core specific thing where they have like included a step where they parse a YAML separately. And then that's why you're able to do this. So I didn't wanna show that because this will not work uh, for any other workflow. Yeah, so the best practice is to put it here because this is where everyone will look. Um, if you're, you know, if you look at somebody else's um, Nextflow pipeline, you're going to be looking for a config file. You're not going to be looking for some obscure YAML that <laughs> is being parsed at a weird time that you don't expect. So if you don't have the parameter, as you said, in the download, uh, all the but because this is being executed in a compute mode, and compute mode does not have access to internet. So it will fail. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. So if you, so, well, it, it depends and we're going to get into this, but, um, oh, sorry. So the question was, uh, what happens if I run this workflow? Um, and then I didn't specify an IG gnomes cache uh, directory, and then the job gets dispatched to a compute node that has no internet access, then it can't download what's going to happen. Um, so the answer is that the job will fail um, because it can't, it can't fetch the references. Um, but uh, this is only true if you actually submit a script that contains the Nextflow execution line, because then the, the base like Nextflow command is being executed on a compute node, and it's that base command that's going to do the fetching. So if you don't do best practices and you actually run that Nextflow command at a login node, where you have internet access, it will fetch the file. Um, but that's kind of uh, like rude to other people because you're kind of using bandwidth and you're using like processing. Um, so it's not great, especially in a situation like this where everyone's going to try to run it at the same time. Um, so yes, um, if you are going to be running in a situation where you don't have internet access, um, that's another great thing about Nextflow is it's completely set up to run offline. So on a computer, like even your laptop where you have internet access, you can download the entire workflow, all the things that you need, and actually put it into a single like gzip tar file. And then you can take it somewhere offline and then unwrap the whole thing and it'll just run. So that's another great thing about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things so far have a storage, you know, and uh, so I guess. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm writing about, but I guess maybe we can store the, the, the reference queue genome on the storage queue. And once the computing know that, then it's generally trying to provide from the read to the local computer. I don't have a or a that put the reference genome on the computing node directly. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So that will completely depend on like the architecture of like the uh, high performance cluster that you're working on. Um, so I believe Phil can correct me. There's a temp deer where you could like copy files onto your compute node, and then that would be faster on I/O. Um, but also, this is there's so many variables here because also some tools don't rely on that much I/O. So like like star alignment. It's going to read like basically the entire reference into your RAM one time. And then, so you need a ton of RAM to run star, but then that way it's not burning a ton of IO trying to like read back and forth to where your data is being stored. Um, but then you're paying in yeah, a different way. Too, really. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's tons of variables here. So that's why um, it's really important to look at kind of the diagnostics of your run afterwards, which we'll see um, in the afternoon. Okay. And you'll see like kind of, where are we under allocated or where are we over allocated? Yeah. So the other piece to add to that is like something like a genome, right? So I, maybe your, your concept of storage node is a little bit misguided, right? So the storage is held on a file system. That file
process. So we, we know we have project, we have scratch. Now that file system can be accessed access by the login node when we log into Sonkai and also by the compute nodes. Now, in something like genomes, those are best to store on projects because this is data that you know you download once, you point to it in your code. Yeah, and, and you're not going to need to write to the reference genome, like you're not making any changes. In it. So you load the reference genome, you keep it on project. Now when you're in your compute node, it's like Derek said, it's going to, it sees the project directory, it's going to read the reference genome, store it into memory on the compute node, and then process there. So as far as where you would store the genomes, it does make sense to download it once, and we, as Walkthrough, we've got it downloaded already for you. This high genomes directory, so you can always refer to it in the project space where we have it. So, make a little more sense. Okay, okay, so I think we're basically ready to run the workflow um so we're going to be preparing to submit a job let's see yeah so we're preparing to submit a job so uh here um because of best practices i wanted to um contain the execution within a shell script so this is, I guess, a traditional like PBS Pro submission script where it's got the PBS header, um, but it exports a bunch of these things um, so that uh, all of, you know, the next little bin that you just added to your path is also here. Um, it specifies your work directory so that it's going to cache everything uh, where you execute from. Um, and then it's also going to uh, do this. So this is an important, uh, line to be aware of. So this is one of those, uh, another one of those things where you want it to run offline. You don't want it to download a ton of things. So in the background, each of the um, processes inside the NF core uh, RNA seq pipeline um, uses its own singularity container. So I'm not going to get really into depth with this. Um, I think Phil did a, a session a few days ago on singularity. Um, but essentially, it's a um, container system that allows you to hold all of your version tools inside one space. Um, and it makes sure that all the dependencies are going to be there. There's not going to be any conflicts. And in that way, each process shouldn't have any issues with tooling. Um, but the thing is that each of these processes needs its own containers. And if you remember back to that kind of metro map, every single node is going to have its own kind of singularity container. Um, so again, for convenience, uh, Nextflow obscures all this from you. And if you just specify that you want to use Singularity, it will download everything uh, on every run. Um, so we all we again have it downloaded at this um, cache directory. So when you specify this environment variable, um, this will tell Nextflow on execution to look here. So this is another, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we made it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So here you can see all of the kind of singularity container images. And you can see uh, they are named by the tools that they contain. Um, so for each one of these, you can see like, for example, this container contains salmon. So it's 15 megabytes. So yeah, you can see all of these are 
um, of varying sizes, but they get quite large. So you don't want to be downloading this for like space reasons, but also just for like network usage reasons. Um, but if any job requires um, like Salmon, for example, it will use Singularity to load up this container and Salmon, specifically version 1.5.2, which has been vetted by the developers to not, you know, um, have any issues with the other tools that are uh, going to be used, um, will be loaded um, on the compute node um, to provide the Salmon executable to that process. Um, and that is, this is where, you know, basically all of the tools are kept. Yeah. Yeah, so let me just don't remember what I called it. Does it miss the law? With a dash. Okay, so there's this really cool tool that NF Core made, um, which is called it's called their NF Core Tools. Um, it's something you can install from Conda, and this is actually the way that I stood up most of the pipeline inside Sockeye. So NF Core Tools has this specific function called download. And this is where you can grab all your kind of the actual pipeline scripts um, and then also the singularity images. So if you do NF Core download, um, you'll get a really nice interactive um, command line thing and you can just specify what you want. So here, let's say we want the RNA-seq. And then you, if you want a specific version, so you're trying to reproduce something, uh, you can go down, um, but otherwise it's defaults to the latest. And then you can here, you can specify your container images. <clears throat> so if you don't have um, that variable set, so So if you don't have this set, it will ask you if you want to specify a cache tier. Um, if you don't specify a cache tier, I think it downloads right into the directory that you were in when you called NF Core download. Um, but yes, if you specify a cache tier, then it will also ask you if you want to add that to your bash RC. So then it'll basically save that location for you forever. So then when you run it on that same system, it will remember that it's keeping singularity containers there. So the great thing about this is if you run multiple workflows, so you're running the RNA seq and you're running attack or you're running cold genome by self-wide, it'll keep everything in one place. Even though it's uh, version Yeah, you don't have to worry about any of that. Yeah. The versions are all pre based on the previous version three eight one like L R N C probably didn't use the same version as the the nice thing about this, and the reason why I'm happy to walk through that, is that Sockeye's compute nodes are not able to pull singularity images from the clock. Mm -hmm. Right? So the best thing to do is to run this, you know, download all the images ahead of time. It's really easy with an F4, and then just point to so you download what is a zip file. And then so you can zip it. It'll ask you if you want to zip it. Um, but if you're going to be running it in place, so you're not like transporting the entire workflow onto a different computer, it's recommended that you don't zip it because there's no reason to. So you can unpack the workflow in place and then it'll it'll run. So Sockeye's compute nodes are an offline place. Yeah. So it's good to have this set up beforehand so then you're ready to offline. Mm -hmm. so first project that was in development is a bit to work locally, then move it to you know, like so like by the CMI to uh, yeah, I would run it on a login mode. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, because it's, it's not actually running a poll, right? It, it's a 
pulling these from like AWS. And, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, not it's doing a pull of Docker and building the image. It's just yeah. Pop. Yeah, it's just a download. Yeah. yeah. I missed the part about the zip. So if you download it as a zip, you would have to move things similarly to the cache file or the cache directory, or do, will it still do its own thing and move it to the cache? No, so if you specify like you want to zip the entire workflow you downloaded mm -hmm. into one file, then everything you need will be in there. So you would need to, if you're going to run it on that machine, you would just have to unzip it. So there's kind of no reason to zip it. It's if if you want to move the workflow to another machine. Um, so let's say like, yeah, let's say you, you work on a cluster in the future that has no internet access, even on the login notes, then you would need to download it like on your laptop and then like FTP it to that computer right yeah so that would be like the main use for that is to like get a like portable one file version of the workflow but if you unzip it it will know to put the similarity thing down into this specific file or do you always make like a new cache because in my opinion i would put all the similarity that i ever downloaded for any direct or for any workflow to one directory so that i'll always just export the same one instead of having, let's say, for the RNA team, I would have many cache directories, or let's say, high gallon another cache directory. So then, in my opinion, it's easier for me to have one single variable for all my NS workflows. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I think, yeah, having one cache directory is definitely the best way to go. I don't actually know how the unzip would work. I feel like if it's yeah, I, I don't because I, I've never I've never tried it, but I don't know if yeah if it would like smartly unzip to like a specific okay. path. Yeah, yeah, but that's yeah that's an option. Um, okay, yeah. So this yes. And for example, if this cash flow, the uh, one button, for example, if we are using the, the star two, not the high star two, and uh, this kind of smart, uh, pipeline to smart pick up the image that we use. And then, but for example, if we have maybe multiple versions, of the image, for example, the Python 3.8 and 3.9, and we have double image, two images for the same team for the different version. And, uh, and, uh, and the conditions that in our configuration file, we forget to set up which version we want. Then, which singularity image will our test flow goes to? Okay. So, all of these images and their versions are being pointed to specifically within the NF core code. Okay. So if you're developing your own code, yeah. then you are going to have to give have to if they're a specific image yeah. name. Okay. So in the NF core code, yeah. somewhere when it calls uh trim galore okay. 0 0.6.7, okay. it's gonna ask where is this directory? Okay. And then it's when you point to that directory, it already knows for this version of NF core 3.8.1, the image name should be exactly that. Okay. It should be exactly as it is depot.galaxy.org slash dash singularity dash trim galore zero point six seven. That whole string, it's not like it's just saying, give me trim galore. Okay. And if there's three trim galores, it's got to pick, right? Okay. It's saying it knows that exact file okay. because it put it there. Yeah, if I forget to maybe set up the version, because we can see after the version, they are so long made. Here. Well, but this is all because it's all automated. Yeah, so yeah. if you're building your own NF core yeah. pipeline, and yeah. you'll see some of this in the afternoon, yeah. and you pull a specific image file, okay. right? You're going to need to point exactly to that okay. image file by name. 
Yeah, it won't be able to run the tool, right? So if, if you said if the next step of your pipeline uses um, string top, right? And you say, and, and in your next flow of code, it says string tie, you know, dash dash bam, and you put the code there. When it gets to the executor, it's going to say, I don't know what string tie means, um, right? I don't know the command string tie. Why should it go here to find the version? Yeah. So then you're you're kind of so there's kind of two things going on. I think what Gary's walking us through here is all very much hands off development. Okay. So you're yeah, right. yeah. So this, if you actually look under the hood yeah. to the code base for N four, that's not the best place to start development. Oh, okay. <laughs> the best yeah. place. So so all of this that you're you're witnessing, yeah. this is all highly orchestrated and dealt with behind the scenes. Oh. So when you're coding your own, and you'll see examples of this in the afternoon, mm -hmm. you're going to need to point exactly to a singularity right. image file that okay. you'll have already downloaded yourself. Oh, okay. So it's not it, it's not as as maybe you know um, simple as just picking this and then starting to make some modifications. Oh. Right. If you really want to build your own from the ground up, well, we're going to talk about that. Okay. And you'll see how these things fit. Okay. Right. You'll see how there's an image that Derek has downloaded okay. that's going to be referenced in a config for his own pre built, really mini pipe. Okay. But if you want, yeah, if you want to show us under the hood for yeah, the code I was going to do that. NF4, it's not a great place to start okay. as, a, as a developer. Yeah, it's a scary place. Thank you. Yeah. So the really briefly, the the question was if I have multiple versions of the and like an NF core pipeline downloaded, so like three point eight, and then also like you know three point seven, um, and then I don't like specify the version. But what happens if I run it and then there's like a conflict in the singularity containers? So as you can see here, all the singularity containers are versioned. So um, a specific version of the pipeline at a high level will know which singularity containers to call. So there will never be uh, any conflict. Um, the other thing is uh, you can actually, because of the way it's downloaded, you don't actually, so if we look at, um, you look at this. So if you, so this is something we might run into depending on how this goes. Um, if you specify the pipeline like this, it will try to download the actual base workflow code off of GitHub. Um, so this may not work when we, if we dispatch it, with this through QSub. Um, this is something I, I wasn't able to test yesterday because of uh, some other space issues. Um, so if this doesn't work, this would have to be just ran from command line interactively, which is not best practices. Um, alternatively, the correct way to do it is if you have a full path to where you downloaded it, this should not say nf-core, -core, because this tells Nextflow to look on GitHub. If this is a full path to a versioned uh, workflow, which I think I downloaded to the only place that had space. Changing directories, it's very scary. You think so? <laughs> Okay. Let's just do this. I think I just, I just it's completely just really... Yeah. So this directory right here, this nf core rnaseq with the version number is what you would place um, in place of um, what the uh, what it said inside run nf core. I think this is not going to work now. Yeah. Yeah, it's just completely gone. Hmm. Uh, okay, so I will fix that during the break. Um, but I wanted to show an example of the code. So just to 
show you how complicated this can get and like having seen you know this workflow and like how many tools are involved um this is not the scary part this is just like the kind of main next flow code that calls a workflow and this workflow is in here i believe and this is like the big code base so you can just see like how much is in here because it's it's very complicated because it's trying to be flexible for as many options as possible um as many user configurations as possible so this is kind of the one uh downside is if you have a very specific need um you may have to write your own but obviously you don't have to write something on the scale um because that is what i did uh and that's what i'll be showing in the afternoon so here we go back you yeah. said that you can run it from the command line or the Oh, yeah. Of course. Well, then the handout mode that shows that one, and what is your GitHub is supposed to find that it actually has. I mean, need this GitHub, one, and I've got some, and it will post the GitHub. The yeah, so it's going to download that file basically. Oh. Yeah, so it's just that file. As long as you have all the other things cached, it shouldn't yeah. be a problem. But because it just doesn't have any internet access at all, it can't even download that. Maybe uh, we'll see. I don't. I don't know exactly how it's going to work. But if, it, if that doesn't work, we'll have to. Uh... You have to oh yeah. You think the best practice is to execute the actual command either on the head node or the locket node or on the computer node. What do we think? Yeah, if you had to pick one, would you say it's best practice to execute your next flow command? So this is the base command that's going to do all the dispatching, parsing your next flow workflow. Should you do this just from the head login node, or should you queue sub a script that wraps your next flow command um, onto a compute node? Yeah, so what, what happens when you launch the next one, right, is that you're going to get essentially a controller. And that controller from there is going to launch jobs to the schedule. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is should that controller command, this next flow command that you have, should you run that just from the command line on the login mm -hmm. node? Yeah, so it looks like, oh, no. Uh, I can't vote. Yeah, so majority of people would say you want to read more on the spread. There's a yeah. lot of people in this. This is a spicy thread. 
the developer. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. but yes. I mean, I personally thought we should run it on the head node. And then, you know, clearly people people don't agree with me. Cool. Yeah. All right. So should we launch it? Yeah. So let's run it. Where are my slides? Okay. So let's try it. Yeah. So this is just the the piece. So this is the important part within that run NF core shell script that just wraps what you would execute from command line, which is just this line right here. So it's next load run NF core RNA seek. Um, and then uh, you specify the profile. So uh, that's another cool thing about all these NF core pipelines is they can be set up to run in a variety of different tooling contexts. So if you like Conda, um, which is actually not recommended by um, NF core, but if you prefer Conda, or that's the only option you have because Singularity is not on, you know, whatever system you're running it on, um, you can specify Conda here. Um, you can specify all kinds of things. Um, that's what the profiles were. Um, then this is the path to the config file that we've just been working on. So all the parameters that we set, they will be in here. And then this extremely confusing params file that is a YAML that contains the iGenomes uh, reference that's going to be parsed before this one. Um, is going to be there, and that's how you're going to prevent having to download most things. No, so profile is a next flow like specific thing. So they used a, a single dash for this. Yeah, I know multiple letter flags that are not double dashed. Unacceptable. Um, yeah, so what you can do is you're going to try to do the Q sub on it, and then we're all going to learn together. Um, and then you can monitor the status of the job using uh, QStat um, to see if your job submitted. So typically this takes uh, 10 minutes in my previous testing, um, but the actual completion time is going to depend on the queue length and uh, when the job actually starts running. It didn't work. Okay, can you like, can you less the uh, the error? If you look, it, it should say like run nfcore.sh.e something something. Yeah, it's the capsule error. So I think that's the one where you don't have these other things. So, um, against my better judgment, I would say. Uh, until I move this NF core path somewhere where everyone can access it. Um, it's quite easy because the origin is set up for 3.8.21, but the updated version is 0.8.22. No, what's no, no, no. It's, it's, yeah, it's trying to it's trying to download just the like that what I showed you that big next flow file because that's not where it thinks it should be. So what I would do is you can copy out this export line right here. Uh, make sure you run that so that you your computer knows where the singularity cache directory is. And then just copy paste this uh, nextflow command into command line and run it there. You're going to run on the login node. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, I will uh, update this to show the correct path, I think. Once I have that moved somewhere common, um, and then I will update everybody on Slack. I voted for that. I voted for that. Yeah. But then it's weird. Like how? How? Like what exactly? Wrong. Like I know you you, you move the order that you said in the board, but. In theory, what should be deacon for you to work out? Where do you move? Yeah, like he's got this folder, the directory in his home. Yeah. Um, he shows the directory again. Yeah. So this is the folder. This is where those capsules are. Um, and this is kind of where all of your tooling is. So, or not the tooling, it's the, the script for the actual workflow. So, 
Yeah. So it's literally this. Yeah, this has to be somewhere on the system. So it grabs it at runtime. So it's just this file, but if you don't have any internet connection, you can't grab it. So it needs to be somewhere on the computer. So that's how you're supposed to use NF Core Download. Is NF Core Download will give you um, this. Um, yeah, I don't think we have it set up. Yeah. So yeah, to run NF, so NF Core, the NF Core command line tool is most easily installed on Conda, which means you need a Conda environment. Um, and then you have to install all those dependencies. But then the thing is, even if you run it, I think, I guess I don't know how it would work. If you pull, if you uh, point it to the singularity cache, I'm guessing it should be smart enough to not re-download them. Um, but I don't know exactly how it works. But the only thing you're really grabbing is just this directory. And unfortunately, it's um, pointed by default to your home. Can you, did you launch it? I did not launch it. I can launch it. Yeah. So here you can see the four jobs. And there's four jobs because there are four samples and they're all being run in parallel. And that's only possible because we've done job dispatching and there's enough resources for everything. Um, so yeah, so this is gonna take a little bit and then I think we can explore this after we return from our lunch break. Um, yeah. Okay, so the last thing, so I guess the main takeaway, um, is that Nextflow is a programming language that lets you write scalable, reproducible scientific workflows. Um, and NF Core is a collection of community developed Nextflow workflows. Um, and it's almost certain that they have a high quality, you know, peer reviewed workflow that's community developed um, with, you know, best practices implemented um, for whatever kind of analysis you're running. So this is the like first place I would look if you have a big, um, data set that you need uh, analyzing and you don't have any help, this would be the, where, the, the place to go. So I have written a big NF Core cheat sheet. So this is generalized to any uh, NF Core workflow, hopefully. Um, and if you follow it, you should be able to do all that stuff. So all the things that I kind of just glazed over with, um, you know, downloading things using uh, the NF Core tools, um, getting those in your path, building the con environment for NF Core tools, um, making sure that you have your singularity cache set up. All of those are in this big markdown. Um, and if you follow this, you should be able to run any of the NF Core workflows on UBC Sockeye. So that is my final gift to you. Yeah. Uh, how do I background this so that I can click? Ah, uh, so I, I mean, I don't know what flow does. I use control Z and then that will set it to the background, but it freezes it. So I think you have to hit BG afterwards and then it'll resume it in the background. Okay. Yeah, if you have Tmux or something, but now that it's already running, I think that's going to be. Yeah, control Z and then immediately. Yeah. Type BG. Yeah. And then it'll say like the job resume. And then if you type jobs, I think you'll see it. Same as putting the name. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mine is running. It's printing stuff on the screen. Cool. So if you put it in, you can put it in. Yeah, you can tell us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so does that conclude the morning session? We can go ahead and yeah. stop the recording, take a break, and be back at 12. Yeah, we will be back at 12. Oh, yeah. So then, yeah, in the afternoon, we're going to be looking at the outputs from this run, and then we're going to dive into writing our own workflow. Um, so that's going to get a little hairy, and um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs>